Hello and welcome to everybody who's joining us just now. Um, my name is Anna Bradley. I'm Executive Director at Sentient Media and I'm really excited about our next session. Uh, I'm equally excited that I can see so many new names coming in today. So that's awesome. Um, I'll just talk a little bit, do a little intro before I pass over to our fantastic speakers today. So this is our fifth in our six part series sentient sessions. Today we have collaboration and activism, strength through alliances, where we're gonna ask, should social justice movements come together? So welcome, I can see some more names piling in now. As we wait to get to capacity, for those of you who are new to sentient media, we're a non-profit journalism organization. We report and offer commentary on the corruption within industrial animal agriculture. We work to bring these stories to the mainstream. We offer a writer's fellowship program where we partner with publications and provide strategic digital marketing to help various social justice causes. We're always asking as a team and with our extended voluntary community and with our fellows, how we can tell better stories about animal lives and reach new audiences getting beyond the echo chamber. And that's one of the reasons we established this series to bring experts within and outside the animal protection industry to help us essentially broaden the scope of our writing. But this series is really for anybody who seeks any kind of social justice through the written word. Um, at Sunny and Media, we've come to the conclusion that in the case of social justice for non-human animals, it's time for us to change the narrative, uh, to uncover different details, think about how we can place different or unlikely heroes at the centre of the story, um, and expose the corruption at the highest level of the meat and dairy industry and explain how it actually impacts everyone. So that's why today's session is probably one of the, I mean, all the sessions are great, obviously, um, but this one is particularly exciting. Uh, a lot of social justice movements uh, do exist in a silo and animal rights is guilty of that and is absolutely no exception to that. Um, and I'm really excited about who we have today to help navigate us through this conversation about how we could uh, make social justice movements come together and what we could do going forward. So we're almost there. Um, today we're hearing from a few fantastic people, all of whom I'm massive fans of. We're hearing from Bio Adelaja, CEO at Do It Now Now, which she set up in response to the gaps in the support available to black innovators building tech companies and social enterprises, and that's in the UK and across Africa. We have Leah Garces, president of Mercy for Animals and author of the great book Grilled, Turning Adversaries into Allies to Change the Chicken Industry. We have Magali Likoli, co-founder of Venceremos, a worker-based organization in Arkansas. Uh, and their ambition is to ensure human rights of poultry workers. And the session is moderated by Ariane Shverdi, who is executive director of Encompass, a nonprofit working to make the animal protection movement more racially diverse, Excel and inclusive. Um, I know for some of you who registered early, you might see there's a slight change in the lineup as Christopher Sebastian sadly couldn't join us today, but I'm very excited about who we do have here. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to share with you some pretty fun and timely news. Um, Encompass, our hen house with uh, Jasmine Singer, who's on our advisory board, and Sentient Media. We've been working together over the last few months to publish a new series called The Encompass Essays, uh, which is basically a collection of um, it's a collection written by leaders in the farmed animal protection movement and you may have heard yesterday we made a little announcement but we're excited to share that Lantern Books and Media have joined the collaboration and turning Encompass Essays into a book. So you can find all the info information on uh, sentientmedia.org encompass-essays. So I think we're pretty much ready. Uh, so thank you from the bottom of my heart to each of our speakers joining us here today. I'm really excited to bring your voices together to hear your points of view, get your experiences um, and, and hear what you have to bring to the table. For our audience, we have Q&A open throughout, so please post as many questions as you like as they come to mind and we'll try and get to them throughout or at the end. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, over to you, Ariane, and to our fantastic speakers. Thank you. 
Hi, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. I will be your moderator today. My name is Ariana Shberdy. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I live in Washington, DC on the land that was stolen by the Nakashtunk tribe. And I always like to acknowledge the indigenous stewards of the land um, here in the, the United States. Um, I am the founder of Encompass. We are a nonprofit working to bring racial equity into the animal protection movement. We do that by um, helping and working with white run and led organizations through um, our consulting services. And if you're um, interested in learning more about that, please do reach out to us. And we also have a caucus for people of the global majority, um, also known as people of color here in the United States, but we try to um, be as globally inclusive as possible. And we work to build community and tap into our leadership potential so that we can um, build and grow the animal protection movement to be the biggest, broadest coalition of people um, possible. So I would love to hand it over to our speakers. Um, Leah, would you like to introduce yourself very briefly and Mercy for Animals next, and then we can go with Magali and Bio. Sure, thanks so much to Sentient Media and also to Arianish and all the other panelists who I'm excited to be here with today. We're going to have a great session. My name is Leah Garces and I am the president of Mercy for Animals. Mercy for Animals mission is to build a more compassionate food system and we do that through reducing the suffering of animals and also through moving towards a plant-based economy. And we have more recently expanded a lot of our work to be more inclusive to be more equitable, to do programs that are looking at how factory farming is specifically affecting BIPOC folks uh, in the United States, but also around the world. So I am super excited to be here and discuss this very important subject with everyone about collaboration. And Leah, can you just share what BIPOC um, is for people who may not know? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Black, Indigenous, people of color. I will try not to use any more acronyms going forward. Thank you. Magali? Hi all, my name is Magali. Thank you so much for inviting me to this important conversation. I am the co-founder and director of Venceremos, which means we will win. And we founded, I've co-founded this organization with a group of poultry workers here in Arkansas. And we've been, uh, ha we aim to adopt the worker-driven social responsibility model that was created in Imocali, Florida to implement it through the poultry industry. So that's our uh, long-term goal. And I'm excited to be here to share a little bit more about, about what we do. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Baya Adelaja, and uh, I'm similarly excited uh, for this session, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. I run Do It Now Now. I've been doing that for about four years, and in that time, we've supported um, 10,000 Black people across the UK and six African countries to build tech enterprises, social enterprises, and nonprofits uh, to basically solve a lived experience that they've, they've had so that they can uh, solve that problem for other people. Uh, apologies, that may be one of the worst introductions I've ever done of Do It Now Now, uh, but it's, it's a bit later in the day in the UK and it's been a long one, but I'm looking forward to having this energetic conversation uh, with all of you. Great, well, let's just jump right in. Um, and please do feel free, um, if you're on the audience, to ask questions through the Q&A. We'll try to integrate them throughout the session and we will have a designated time at the end um, to also go through them. So um, we'd love everyone to contribute here in the panel, but the first question, at least to start, we'd love to direct towards Magali. Um, over the course of history, at least in the animal protection movement, animal advocates have at times, rarely, but have at times, vilified farmers and slaughterhouse workers. Um, what do you see as the opportunities for building connection and finding common ground to collaborate with these communities and, and the movements who are fighting for them? Yeah, so this is a very deep question in terms of like, uh, we are based in Arkansas and the majority of the workers, I want to acknowledge this important piece, like the majority of the workers processing uh, the meat or the, the chicken are coming from uh, our immigrants or refugees or Asians or blacks. So those are very vulnerable communities that often lack 
of knowledge of the rights. Often uh, they are uh, based in, in white rural communities where often there is a lot of racism, discrimination. And it's often that they don't have a voice, but really nobody listens to these workers. And so I think the, the collaborations are so important to lift the, the, the power of, of, of the voice of these workers that often feel like they don't have their powerless, they don't have hope. And so here in Arkansas, for example, the majority of the workers in the Northwest Arkansas are from Central America, Mexico, El Salvador, Puerto Rico, uh, Marshallese that came uh, because of the U.S. invaded their or took the was testing bombs in their in, in in their lands. So many of them came because they didn't have any any other place to live, and most of them come to work in the processing plants. So. For us, uh, living in Arkansas, it often feels so isolated and it often feels like we don't have power enough to, uh, to change the working conditions of these workers. And we often aim to work with farmers, with people that are also oppressed in different ways. And so it's so important to understand the backgrounds of these workers to really understand how to build those collaborations. Uh, because it's often that I hear uh, people that w the animal welfare uh, world that are fighting for animal rights often blame the workers who are killing the these animals, right? But it's so important to understand that nobody, none of these workers wants woke up and think that I want to kill chickens, right? It's just uh, this is a job that often they don't have any other option to work somewhere else. Uh, and, and so like Arkansas employs nearly 3,000 workers. So it's almost impossible for these workers to find other jobs. So it's not about like killing or not killing, it's about understanding the deep uh, oppression that occur within our system, our food system, that is harming animals, harming farmers, harming workers. So uh, I am here really to, to, to establish that conversation and to set the path of how we can all bring together the issues and find common solutions to change uh, this reality that is unsustainable in many ways. I often say that we can't talk about sustainability without really talking about workers. And workers are often left out of those conversations. And we want to bring to assure that when we talk about sustainability, we talk about workers' rights. And so, and so yeah, that's uh, what I want to add. And um, I'm here to, uh, to, to explore more ideas of how to bring collaborations to be stronger together. Um, shall I uh, interject? Uh, um, I really, uh, truly love uh, everything that you were saying, uh, Magali, because uh, I was actually thinking about a lot of the work that we do recently uh, in the light of immigration and the effect that immigration and no recourse to public funds, which is the terminology in the UK when you're not allowed to gain any access to um, benefits from the government because of your immigration status. So there are very few options available to you and I was thinking about it and working uh, working on it in the context of uh, income inequality that uh, Black people face when they immigrate um, emigrate, excuse me, from an African country to the UK or any other place, and have to de are dealing with uh, awareness of the social and cultural capital that they had in their own country. So they have this uh, kind of willingness to become upwardly mobile and socially able and access resources and kind of make the best of any situation which is why immigrants tend to be so interested in education because that's an obvious route to mobility but then when you don't have access to public services that are so um so needed you don't have access to advisory services that are needed and then you don't have access to jobs because i mean in the uk it's likely the same thing in america but uh certainly in the uk it's very demographically linked the black people live in the poorest neighborhoods across every single neighborhood across every single county borough whatever you want to call it so when you kind of have all of those things linking you find that uh you get you take what you get i mean my mom uh 
came my mum came from a relatively affluent family decided to that she wanted to have her kids go to school in the UK went against her um my dad and her her family's choices and decisions and kind of was like I'm gonna do it anyway came to this country with 300 pounds in a pocket um two pairs of trousers and a couple of t-shirts and was like let's go and uh she was stacking shelves in the supermarket like she she was an accountant she was a director of um a media company like she was amazing in Nigeria she was amazing in the UK as well but she did whatever it took to make sure that she could provide for my brother and I and it's those sorts of sacrifices that should be highlighted recognized and supported regardless of the situation in which they um the the um the situation in which not necessarily regardless because it there are limits, but they, we should be recognizing the humanity of those situations rather than necessarily what is being done. And I, I really love um, what Magali is saying there. My turn, right? Okay. <laughs> um, well, first I wanna just agree, but I also wanna make it interesting. So I wanna say, yes, totally agree. Um, meat companies thrive on profiting both on animal cruelty and on the exploitation of workers. And I think Magali, we spoke the other day and you pointed out that our immigration policy, the immigration policy in Arkansas was created, was paved so that people could work in the poultry in industry. That they're, they're, it's specifically carved out to, to permit, to promote that exploitation. Um, and these companies, they cut corners, they cut costs by taking it out on the animals and the workers. They are the ones who pay the price. And we can't let that happen. Uh, and for so long, I think these two groups have worked separately. And just, I wanna give a little con like history to that because I think that's changing and it's changing dramatically and fast. And I'm really excited to be part of that and to be creating coalitions with worker groups. But if we rewind historically, and you know, it's not just mercy for animals, but it is mercy for animals. Historically, we have blamed workers. And so we take and receive or see footage in which there's a gray area here where we have footage of a farmer or uh, a worker who has done something egregious to an animal. And we see that footage and we feel some kind of moral act necessity to take action. But on the other hand, what we've learned and where we're, why we, I think we're better off now. So that has happened and I want to acknowledge that. I want to acknowledge the kind of carceral, carceral approach that we've taken, which is, you know, prosecuting a worker or a farmer. And why I think that is not the way to go and doesn't work is because of this. You target the person as a culprit rather than the system. You target one individual and that's not our goal. And in fact, you can make things much worse when you do that because what you do and what we saw happening over and over again for a long time was a company almost was collaborating with us saying, that's one bad apple, we're firing them, we'll put them in jail, we'll prosecute them, we'll deport them. And then they carry on and the animals and the workers are no better off and there's no long-term impact. And so there's this concept, which is not my concept, which is that you have to hate the oppression and not the oppressor. That you have to think about the systemic change and not the individual, like quick win media hit that you might get from something rather than the overall system. Now that work is a lot harder. It takes a lot more work. It takes a lot more collaboration. It takes less individual organizational wins and a lot more deep work that you have to do to collaborate. So it can take longer, but I think it has more of a lasting effect uh, on, you know, the organization and on, you know, on the system you're trying to change. And, you know, when I think I have like, you know, like you, Bayou, I have my, my dad left, my dad left Colombia during a period of violence. And my grandmother came here with five kids on her own to Miami with a thousand dollars, like in her bank. And then that's all you needed was like a, a bank account with some money and in you come and that's it and you know a couple years later they had their 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 u.s citizenship and boom it's very different now and there's a there's so much there's so so many nuances to why people are coming here and we have to think about the root of that and in the case of arkansas Magali was 
and you can speak more on this, the system is created in cooperation with exploitation of workers to create a cheap system for producing protein. And so we have to look at the root of the problem. We have to go after the root of the problem, not just quick one-off wins that look right in the moment. We have to look the helicopter view at every, every moment we can. Thank you for adding that nuance, Leah. I think that that's something um, in the animal protection movement, which is the space I inhabit, that nuance is really important. I'm curious, Magali, if you have any reflections or anything to add to that. Yeah, I just want to add that it's true that the poultry industry is one of the fastest growing industry among the meat sector. And it's been growing too fast in the last decades that it has very few regulations and really very little uh, poultry plants are unionized. I think is the less unionized uh, meat sector among the others. And and so that creates this power now like and also these companies have gained so much uh power over the government that they've been able to to reduce the the uh the the benefits to workers right now during the pandemic it's so insane that these companies were able to uh to 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 increase the line speed to 174 birds per minute and so and that happened over the, like we never knew until it happened and it's so incredible the power that these companies have to even force the government to give them protections during the pandemic when they were not acting immediately to protect workers over 45,000 uh, meat packing workers have tested positive of COVID-19 and so it is true that this industry is growing too fast and it just aims to uh, to exploit more workers to to have cheap meat but also at what cost is the meat being produced is the what is the human cost of your chicken right and so yeah those are very important points that if we don't act immediately it's gonna be too late rather than early whenever we want to change things so i think we are uh, I am hopeful that we are on time to to really try to dig in and to change the systems that are keep oppressing everyone. Are there efforts, um, Leah or Magali, as you work on this, that um, you're that are kind of top of mind as you think about the poultry industry and workers? Are there opportunities for collaboration right now? Are there things that the federal government are considering doing to or even state governments to make things worse? What does the landscape look like right now? Well, right now, I mean, the landscape looks really uh, dark in terms of like the government is not really acting to protect workers. We had this uh, huge disappointment on OSHA that we're not reinforcing anything whatsoever. Uh, the USDA allowing the increase of line speed. So really, we it's very uh, hard times politically that they have politicized all of this issue that now the workers ourselves are paying the price of that. Uh, right now, as I said at the beginning, Venceremos aims to adopt this, the worker-driven social responsibility model because we believe that the only thing that could change this industry is by forcing or setting a code of conduct reinforced by the supply chain and that will have market consequences if they don't follow through that code of conduct. These companies act on, on money, on profits, and if they could see the risk on their profits by not protecting the workers or, 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 comply, or complying with the code of conduct, and the risk of losing those profits, we believe that is one is is what is going to make the the changes happen. It is just what happens in the tomato farm industry in Imokali because of this code of conducts and these reinforcements, legal binding agreements between the organizations and the supply chain and the monitoring. Because right now there is no such a change if you don't monitor in the changes, if you don't, if there is no market consequences, if you don't follow through. And then anything like when we say we win, we have to make sure that what we win will have impacts in the next years, not just only this year. So that's what we, uh, we think that it can bring those changes that we want by, uh, by 
uh, putting this code of conduct or by creating this code of conduct and make the supply chain to adopt the, the standards of how workers need to be treated in the plant. Do you mind if I add to that? Okay, so um, agree on the, the market side. I'll add on the legislative side where I think the possibilities are and I'll be just speaking from a US perspective. So Bayo, you might wanna add from a, a UK or a international perspective. Um, I think that there are two measures we could take on that could vastly improve both worker and animal safety. And we're advocating for those. And those are slowing down the line speeds. So we've talked a little bit about that. And then the second is banning the practice of live shackle slaughter. And that's where animals are shackled uh, alive and stunned afterwards. And what happens is uh, there's a lot of thrashing around, scratching, blood, et cetera. And it's very difficult for the workers, especially if the line speeds are going for 175 birds per minute, if you think about how fast that is. Um, and those two measures together are things we're uh, advocating for. So should we get a new administration uh, in the United States we, they could simply end this USDA high-speed slaughter program by suspending the current regulatory waivers that have been issued for pigs and chickens and decline issuing any new ones. And there's actually currently a bipartisan bill in play that was introduced by Congresswoman Fudge and has nine co-sponsors in the Senate, including VP candidate Kamala Harris and 32 in the House. And it's for slowing down the line speeds. So we hope that gets some traction. It's bipartisan, it's protecting workers, protecting animals. We really think that's the way it should go. Um, the second is a banning of live shackle slaughter towards some upgrades in terms of the way the slaughterhouses are run. We think that, um, I think that the attention that we've been able to bring to the problems within slaughterhouses during COVID have been tremendous. We've gotten a lot of media coverage where we never got it before about the problems that exist, where the rest of us are standing six feet apart, workers are standing shoulder to shoulder and being infected by COVID and dying in larger numbers as hotspots. So this is a chance for us to really highlight this in the political sphere, and we're really trying to do that. Uh, in terms of uh, what I can add to the conversation, uh, unfortunately, my expertise is not in animal rights at all. So the context in which I can speak is very is limited on that front. However, what I can say is uh, actually what you ended with, Leah, in that there is a lot of opportunity right now to have workers and animal rights activists collaborate in the kind of light whistleblowing of what is actually happening in those spaces. And uh, in terms of just going back to what we started, well, well, what Magali started the conversation with in terms of the humanization of the experience of, of workers in this context of animal rights and the work that they are doing. Um, if the animal rights activists are, as you said, Leah, um, working on these coalitions to engage uh, workers' rights activists in a more, uh, more beneficial way for them as well, then surely the, I'm, I'm hesitant to applaud COVID, uh, mid-COVID uh, media and mid-COVID uh, movement because COVID will end eventually and it, the, the attitude changes um, that if we don't work on ensuring that the awareness uh, moves into an attitude change that is actually uh, goes beyond a year or two years of being aware of something and just kind of making a small, I, I'll buy less of this and more of this. That's a good change. But if we want to see uh, sustained collaboration between workers and animal rights activists and uh, sustained collaboration between those groups and legislation, uh, my, imagin well, my imagination is that there'd, be, there'd have to be a lot more work done on ensuring that people recognize the importance of workers' rights because that to me at least is the core piece that because work in context of immigration and context of my awareness of US politics as as also my awareness of UK politics, there the dehumanization and desensitization of the uh, of the needs of uh, working class uh, people means that you don't technically in on mass in the population recognize the need their needs as 
valid compared to yours as a person that doesn't necessarily exist in those spaces. And it's one, it's one thing to say that we're working together the, as activists, but it's a whole different thing to say that the population recognizes that these issues exist on both ends of it. Um, in a pre-call uh, that we had uh, yesterday, Aranesh, um, we talked about Peter and my kind of, the, where my, as a populist in, in this conversation, <laughs> where my uh, deep understanding of animal rights uh, begins and ends in it, the center of that is Peter, unfortunately, for very good reasons, um, mainly to do with their budget. But uh, the understanding goes with, uh, if there is, that has been the, there is that ability within the, po popular media to have that awareness because of organizations like Peter for Good or for Bad, but there isn't that same thing on the workers' rights side, and both need to work together for this to have lasting change. That, yeah. Um, we have about four minutes left on this topic before we move to the next one, but there was a question that came in from the chat that's um, a bit sticky, but I think it's worth asking. How can we gain the trust and support of poultry workers if we are ultimately campaigning for their jobs to cease to exist? Um, and I think the we there is the animal, you know, the animal protection space. And maybe Leah, I don't know, do you have thoughts on that to start? Sorry, there's always that awkward, where's my mute button? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, can you just summarize one more time? Because I was looking for my my yes. Mute. How do we gain the trust and support of poultry workers if we are ultimately campaigning for those jobs to cease to exist? Yeah, that's a good Resolve. question. Yeah, I don't know if you also want to jump in. Um, so this is something that we've had to answer a lot in my organization. When we first started campaigning on this issue, started collaborating with worker rights groups, it may come as a surprise or not a surprise to you that some of our members push back and were saying, what are you talking about? These are people who are actively killing animals and we're against killing animals. And we had to spend, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's very important to build literacy and understanding from the bottom up to start from where people are at on this. And you have people who only understand it from the poultry worker perspective, and you have people who only understand it from the animal rights perspective. And you have to start from wherever your constituents are at and build their literacy till we get to some like shared space, which is what we're trying to do right now. Um, and acknowledge that this discomfort and this stickiness does exist and it has to be addressed. Um, and the way that we have addressed this with some of our, our our folks or our members is you kind of ask them put yourself in the shoes of a slaughterhouse worker and people don't work and I think Magali you spoke to this they don't work in a slaughterhouse because they want to kill animals but because there are almost no other options or no other options for them and they're coming from terrible situations maybe escaping from violence escaping from and they want more opportunity and they're coming to a new country and this is what's given to them and it's the only thing given to them. And no one else wants to do this job. It has one of the highest turnovers in the entire country. It's considered the most dangerous job in America by OSHA, not me. And you know, just some, and we try to depict that. We say workers, they suffer from sexual harassment, intimidation, dangerous work conditions, abusive practices. There's you know, really good human rights watch stories and, and research on injured workers, on um, abuse to women, Latina women in particular, uh, them having to wear diapers because they don't get breaks, and really trying to come at it from the deepest perspective and spend a lot of time building literacy around this issue to say, do you know what, if we offered or could problem solve together a solution, they're not gonna want this job. And I'll say one example that we're currently thinking through is we're transitioning, we have a project called Trans Farm 
transformation, which is transitioning poultry work, poultry farmers from uh, poultry to hemp or mushrooms. Now, one of the farms we're working with is saying, you know what, there's going to be like hemp harvest days, for example. Could we have some of the slaughterhouse workers come work on processing hemp and really like problem solving from that perspective? I think you do, I mean, I'm talking to a lot of politicians lately, um, and you can't just come in and say, shut down this industry. Like you said, what, 3,000 jobs? Like you can't just, that's not, you have to come in with alternatives. And I think bio you're, you've come up with, you know, entrepreneurial ideas and supporting concepts and um, progress and ideas. And that's the kind of thing we need to come together to find solutions like that, to support transition to, to fast track transitions. Thank you. Um, for the sake of time, we do need to move on to the next um, segment, which is looking at rural communities. Um, so I wanted to ask, so factory farms, processing plants, slaughterhouses usually exist in rural and poor communities. Oftentimes they are communities that um, are lived in by black, indigenous and other people, other communities of color, but sometimes there are white community, you know, poor white communities. Um, what are the opportunities for collaboration to engage these communities authentically without co-tailing other issues that those communities face? Um, that impact their lives directly. Leah, do you want to start with this one? Yeah, I just spoke, so I wasn't sure. If I I'm know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like, I'm taking a, I know this is, yeah, okay. So, um, well, I think first it's very, this is a great subject to pick through and we don't spend enough time doing it. Um, Rural communities are ground zero for animal agriculture. They bear the most immediate burden from factory farming and slaughterhouses. And we know that animal ag causes these communities, which are often poor and politically and socially disenfranchised, they cause them extraordinary harm. So just some examples, we've talked a lot about slaughterhouse workers suffering from physical and emotional distress that ripples out into their community. Um, and we, of course, have talked about COVID-19 and the hotspots and workers there. Uh, slaughterhouse workers in, in uh, factory farms also, slaughterhouses, sorry, in factory farms also cause really horrific air, water, and soil pollution, which has really terrible effects on community health and livelihoods. And in many cases, it's poor Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities that are disproportionately affected by this. Major meat companies uh, claim that they're providing these jobs, like we just said, and revenue to rural communities. But studies show the exact opposite, that as big ag moves in, rural towns and families end up worse off economically, socially, politically, educationally, all the things. Um, Rural communities are often food deserts, ironically. They have very little access to healthy, affordable, good food. Uh, farmers themselves suffer from being indentured servants. And this is something that I work a lot on. They're bound by restrictive contracts from exploitive meat companies. Uh, many haven't received raises in decades. They're buried in this massive debt. They want out and they can't get out. Uh, our movement has overlooked these communities for decades. And instead of focusing on urban populations, we, you know, we believed we focused more on urban populations we believe were more likely to join our cause because that's where we're from quite often in the staff. But I think we can't ignore that anymore because in fact, those that are closest to an issue are the mo have the most to gain from addressing it and are often the most knowledgeable, active and passionate about finding creative solutions. Uh, so I'm excited about moving in that direction and really thinking through involving rural communities more in this work, uh, which we have not traditionally done in the animal rights space. Uh, and Mercy for Animals, like I said, we're working to do that. We have a project, like I mentioned, called Transformation, where we partner with former or current factory farmers to help them transition to plant-based agriculture. And I'm excited to share that we just two weeks ago went to Texas and witnessed our first transition from, hemp, uh, from chicken factory farming to hemp. Um, so we really believe that there's a lot of progress that we can make that we're not making right now when we connect with those rural communities because the, in reality, they're really suffering too and um, they're excited to take part of creating a better food system, being ones who carve that out with us. 
Magali, do you have, or um, Bio, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so I live in a rural community. <laughs> so uh, I often, uh, I often tell, uh, because some, sometimes national organizations want to collaborate with us, but they just sometimes don't want to tokenize us, right? And I think that it has to be the collaboration, it has to be meaningful, truthful, honest. And, and so that way we don't feel used or we don't feel like someone is taking advantage of us, right? Uh, and that connection is crucial because I said this because often uh, national organizations, they just come to us and just sign this or be in the picture or we want your, to use your name, and then the rest of the year they forget us. <laughs> and I think that uh, that is obviously is not going to work anymore if, if any other organization knows that. I mean, we, the thing is like, we have solutions because we live here, right? And so it's important to always acknowledge uh, what part of you are in the question? Are you uh, an ally or you want to lead or what is your part of all of this? If you are an ally, if you want to uh, help other uh, communities to grow and to explore or other ways of, of raising animals or growing food, then it has to be very meaningful because as I said, we live here, we know our, we have the solutions and it's often that nobody wants to listen to our solutions, right? And so I think that there is a lot of power dynamics that sometimes play out, the racism, the power dynamics that comes from people living in the city versus people living in the rural areas it's often believe that we don't know because we have less resources because probably some people believe we are more ignorant or I don't know. You know, I think those dynamics needs to change in order to have a more meaningful collaboration. And, and it's often like here, for example, I am uh, from a city in Mexico City, in Mexico City, in Mexico, I, I was raised in a, I, I come from a city. So for me living in this town, it's all, it was also shocking. But I came to understand that, and often it's just we are like in Mexico, even if you live in rural areas, there are access to food, and growing your food and it's it's really healthier than it is here and so there is often this lack of resources of anything that has been imposed like the food when you go to the grocery store often is expired you know in, in like in mississippi alabama all these places if you go to any regular store often there is the food is just less it's less quality and, and so what really needs to happen is the what resources are we giving to these communities to create their own solutions and that is often what is not happening and i think it needs to be broader like what money comes to this organization more uh white-led organization versus uh uh brown organization that we often have less resources because there is less trust and how we can manage our own resources and money. And that is often comes along with racism and power dynamics. And so, and so yeah, I think that the potential is there. It just are really setting ourselves where we are and how meaningful we want to be with this community that often lack in resources. Um, I've Feel there's little I could add to the points that were made um, but what I can talk about is our own experience so as a lived experience led organization so we uh, empower people with lived experience of certain situations to create solutions to those experiences so that other people don't have to exp um, experience the same thing um, I think it's extremely important to empower people that have the have overcome challenges or have experienced challenges to design the ways out of it because um, they will always have a much clearer purview. So one of the things that we've done recently um, with uh, the COVID crisis is recognizing uh, that the 
charities and social enterprises that we support, so Black-led charities and social enterprises in the UK, that uh, are 50% 50 of their team are people that have experienced the problem that they're solving directly. So whether that's um, hunger, uh, lack of uh, opportunity to employment or whatever it might be. Uh, and uh, they are also majority, um, the majority of the beneficiaries are also black people. Uh, we've been, we've raised some money to provide them with a grant uh, so that they can continue their work in the midst of COVID because a lot of them were financially strapped because they lost their um, their income streams. And we're also providing 12 months of support. So we're co-creating a, a program of support with them so that they can tell us exactly what they need and we can bring our own expertise to the table as well. And we'll find partners from all the big corporations as well as the individual experts to support them for 12 months to ensure that they can continue doing what they're doing for many, many years to come. Um, I say that to say that we, it is, it wasn't, it's not a hugely expensive program to run uh, and it's all based on the partnerships that we already have. And it, but the impact of it is much stronger than we could have potentially done on our, on our own because I mean, by supporting, we're supporting 16 organizations through that program and they all have beneficiaries of at least 10,000 themselves a year. Uh, so that's 160,000 people that we don't have direct access to that are being supported by those organizations. And if we just kind of keep doing that, and it wasn't, it was 3,000 pounds we gave each of them, the program itself is more expensive than that. Uh, but by just doing those little things, by ensuring their sustainability and their, their access to information, their access to further funding, um, and their access to each other, more importantly, so that they can learn from each other um, and support each other through what, the difficulty of building a business or a social enterprise or a charity. Um, we're kind of ensuring that they don't have to need, they don't need us, but we're there to support them as a backbone organization. And that sounds like a model that could be quite useful within uh, this. So if you want to go to your funders and say that you would like to do a similar program, I am happy to give you the, the text that we used. Thank you. Um, any final thoughts on rural communities? Okay, um, let's move on to black rights and then um, we'll have an opportunity for more questions. So if you have questions and you're on the audience, please do feel free to um, throw them in the in the chat. Um, so when Bio and I were chatting yesterday, she said something that um, really resonated with me. None of us would be activists if our ideas were mainstream. And I think that sometimes we need to keep that in mind. So um, I guess the question for, for the group and Bio, let's start with you is, um, why is it important for social justice movements, especially those fighting for Black lives, to come together now? Um, well, I think in terms of coming together, I mean, what is the saying? Uh, Sticks in a bundle are not easily broken. Um, just by by sheer numbers, we're much we're much louder, stronger together, and we the ability to share resources means that we can amplify each other's voices a lot stronger. Um, and I've always been a big believer in like, okay, so in the UK, there's, there are 2 million, according to the last census, there are 2 million uh, black people in the UK. Um, there are 40 million black people in the diaspora and going to be a billion black, black people in Africa relatively soon. There is no way one organization could solve every single problem that is relating to racial equality, um, any of the other youth unemployment is one that we're passionate about across Africa specifically. Uh, there is no one organization that can do that because the budget just one doesn't exist. Well, it does, but just isn't being used for that. Um, there is, so we need each other. We desperately need each other to be able to move the needle forward. And importantly, we need each other to keep each other in check because there are so many things that kind of happen that as if you're on your own and on an island, you don't really get to, kind of uh, have that great sounding board. You don't really get to learn from other people's mistakes. And I think the benefit of this particular time is that everyone is, uh, the, the world has become a lot smaller because we all exist 
via screens, well, most of us anyway. So the attention that you can get get um, be, without have people having to leave, leave their homes means that you have more access to people. And that means you're having more and more conversations, you're meeting more people than you would otherwise. And that has allowed a lot more, like, quick bonding, a lot more conversation, um, a lot more change maker conversations. And it's meant that you can easily, well, relatively easily, move the needle a lot further forward than you would otherwise. I mean, in the UK, things uh, are happening by the uh, drop of the hat it, it across uh, Africa, the NSARS movement, well, in Nigeria specifically, the NSARS movement uh, started as, uh, it's similar to the George Floyd uh, murder, started as a video, um, then moved into the tech sphere, which is why, well, how we got involved because it was like, oh, okay, we work with tech entrepreneurs, our tech entrepreneurs are care a lot about this this is a thing that we should be talking about and seeing what we can do uh, and then it became a everyone I mean there was a there was a video of a protest where a woman um was like beeping her horn in Nigeria which is just normal but you know she was really irritated about, at the protest and uh the a bunch of young people came up to her and said look we're sorry this is inconvenient for you but this is this is why this is happening and she got out of her car and started protesting as well because it's something that has affected her uh the problems that we're trying to solve are universal to a lot of people they just don't act they just don't have that kind of framing of this is why it's a problem for me and not even necessarily a problem for me but why this is why i care about it i mean animals animal rights workers rights those are things that i mean i I care about, but I, I don't care. I would be working on them if I cared about them as much as you guys. But I obviously don't care about them as much as you guys do. But I have a modicum of care because I'm a human being that has compassion for things. So um, things and people and so on and so forth. But if you can tap into the care that I have for my and tap into my own humanity as a, as a, as a living, breathing person, then moving helping me move the needle further means that we can all do something fantastic together and i just think we're missing a trick quite honestly if we're not actively trying to collaborate at every single opportunity um and i honestly i, I i'm really suspicious of organizations that i see not collaborating it's really weird i'm done <laughs> I can, I, yeah, I think it's weird too. Very suspicious. I agree. Um, well, um, thank you for that. It was very, um, yeah, I am on the same page as you and, you know, we've talked about workers' rights when we talk about black rights as well here in the United States, that's really in sharp focus right now with BLM and it's, Speaking from the perspective of an animal rights activist, I can say with certainty that if we ever hope to have an inclusive and equitable movement, you know, it's past time that we stand in solidarity with the movement for black lives and put our time, energy, and resources behind black activists and into anti-racist action. So, you know, we have done a couple of things to really actions matter more than words. We did do an anti-racist statement and it laid out these nine points that we're trying to achieve and work through where we really were thoughtful about like, what does that mean for the animal rights movement to be anti-racist? How does that change how we're going to have to work and our programs? And for me, one of the things that we started to look at is, you know, that how do we matter to black communities and why would we matter to black communities and one of the things that comes into really sharp focus is health and health in communities right so as i said before like factory farm products fast food are affecting people of color more than anyone else and in the ways they're doing that is through diseases through chronic diseases like um, you know, obesity and heart disease, diabetes. This is where specifically big meat is targeting communities. And that, um, and, and so if we want, that is an intersection where we can matter. And by promoting and making plant-based food more accessible um, and working through a health lens that rather than a strict like animal rights or nothing lens, 
we can achieve both things. We can achieve both engaging and, um, and I, I'm trying to use the right word, but engaging communities of color in a way that they need, that they want, that they're asking for, while also taking animals off the plate and then, you know, and, and achieving our, our mission as well. And so we're really looking at our, our programs from that perspective going, okay, we're going to have to really think about if we, for example, want to attract more black activists to organization, we have to do programs that matter to black communities, for example. And so through this, this health perspective is one, one type of example. Another is we, um, and, and a, a, quite often what people will do is go, okay, we just need to have more, you know, black staff. That's the answer. And that's like the last thing you do after you've done all of the like inner work, right? Um, and one thing we're also doing, we have a new program called the People's Fund, which we just launched, which is giving out grants specifically to black activists working um, in the space, trying to amplify their voices and their vision, um, you know, get to know them and what they're doing and what matters and what works. Uh, so we have a, so check that out, the People's Fund, it's called, Mercy for Animals, I think it's backslash the People's Fund. Um, and again, that's like an action, like putting really our money where our mouth is. Like, do, are we anti-racist? Do we care about this? Yes. Okay. Put some money into it. And it's this idea of like, you know, kind of funding an entrepreneur in this space. And it's a pilot this year. We have put aside a hundred thousand dollars for that. And if it works, hopefully we'll be able to do more of that kind of thing. But, you know, I think it's really important. And I don't think we'll achieve our mission of creating a compassionate food system without really head on addressing this. And I think we've kind of it's, it's sad to me that we've missed this so clearly and we've been so, you know, think animal rights has to be about animal rights and not think about it in this more, um, this richer context, which I think is going to achieve more faster and for a more sustainable um, outcome. Um, so just quickly, uh, if you don't mind, uh, I was um, one of the things that I because I was vegan for a year and a half and then I moved into vegetarian ish. I'm trying to move back to vegetarian. I'm it's it's a sliding scale. It's happening anyway. Um, one of the things I recognized when I was vegan and uh, in the times afterwards because I have a lot of vegan friends who are black. It's that, and this happens across all black things. Like because obviously like you find there's black Twitter, there's black LinkedIn, there's black, uh, there's black, all of these like subcultures that form within spaces because the mainstream culture doesn't feel fitting or like it's accommodating to the, to the things that uh, black people um, want to talk about uh, in, in a way that feels authentic and meaningful to that community. Um, what tends to happen is that you will find in that subculture, in the kind of main in the kind of subculture of that subculture there is an animal rights act um, movement that is happening but it does not try to engage necessarily with the mainstream animal rights movement because there is that if you're being if you're you've a subculture within your own subculture there is a trepidation about then going out to the mainstream and be like hey i'm a subculture of a subculture but will you maybe help us out and try and make us mainstream and what does mainstream even mean because there is a sort of inauthenticity in trying to fit into what is considered normal or right especially when your understanding of your own community does not match up with what that normal or right is in the mainstream of the animal rights movement for instance so if exactly as you just said Leah if everyone is kind of saying this is the only way that it can be and this is the the line well if your own community and the people that you would most like to see moved further down the path of this uh, um in this experience of this movement aren't ever you you know based on your own experience of them in your community they're not going to get to that line and if that's if that's the end goal and that's the only goal that you could be aiming for then you're automatically removing yourself from the discussion and saying, well, rather than that, what I'll talk about is we need, how about you grow your own vegetables? Get more into that. Or like, how about you just like cut a few things off of your table and get more into that? Or let's exercise together and talk about supper clubs and cook for each other. And, th and you get this 
this really impactful movement that happens within that space, but it doesn't look like or feel like the general animal rights movement space, but it does talk to it. It does kind of have that, there are ridges that could form together. And I, I mean, only God knows what the um, Beyonce's 22 day campaign has done for people in the black community specifically of just like, this is something I can do. It's not that hard to switch a meal a day um, to kind of make at least one meal a day vegan. Like, those things, I think it's so important, particularly when you're working with cultural groups, to just find one entry point and make that an open discussion. Because if you if you inspire one person, I, I, I always say this, like one, my friend telling me, oh, I've been vegan for like a couple of months. It's not that, like, it's, it's kind of cool. My friend telling me that is going to do a heck of a lot more for me than a hundred adverts because that's just how my brain works. And I think most people, maybe not a hundred, maybe three adverts, like for, the fourth advert might get them. But I'm just so, I just don't trust campaigns very often because I, I make campaigns. So I'm just like, oh, okay, I see what you're trying to do there. So I think it's important to kind of, to ensure that the people that are even a little bit interested, particularly if they don't come from a demographic that is central to the movement that you're, you're already building, are being invited to just talk about what they think it could be and empower to take that little part of it back to their own community and reflect it in a way that feels natural and normal to them and kind of have a satellite movement that allows them to connect um, effectively with you guys so that they can build something that makes sense for them. Thank you. My golly, I'm, um, I know it's been a while since you spoke. I'd really love to hear what you, what you think around collaborating, especially with um, the black community. Is she frozen? Oh no. Meaning that the people who are organizing are the people directly affected by the issues. So in Northwest Arkansas, the workers organizing have been Latino workers. And in South Arkansas, we have more black communities, but here in the Northwest Arkansas is less uh, black communities working in, in the poultry. And so venceremos, it's in Spanish, right? And so a lot of people were like, why is the name uh, in Spanish? So you are excluding other groups. You're excluding the people that don't speak Spanish. And I said, why? Well, why don't we? I mean, the thing is like Latino workers have never said, I'm fighting only for the Mexicans or the Puerto Ricans, or they have never, never, never said anything like that. They are fighting for everyone. So I always refer to poultry workers because it doesn't matter the, their uh, demographics, we are fighting for all. But in terms of like organizing, we can't we can't say we are a black uh, organization or or just bringing or hiring a black guy just to to say that we are it's nothing like that it has to come natural it has to come organic that the people that are organizing come to the group and organize their communities like uh bio said right to 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 open the spaces so they can bring their own community and create their own spaces within our space. I can't claim that I represent certain groups because I, I don't want to tokenize. I don't want to, to claim something that I am not. The fact that we speak Spanish and the workers organizing are Latino doesn't mean that we are excluding others. All of everybody is welcome to organize but we can't per se say we are fighting only for these groups or only for that group because this doesn't work like that. And especially in labor, uh, poultry industry and the poultry plants often are various demographics. Like here, I can tell you here in Springdale, Arkansas, in one plant, there is Marshallese, Mexican, Salvadorian, Puerto Ricans, and often they are fighting among each other because that's purposely done by the company. The company wants that these groups keep fighting because the Mexicans believe that the Marshallese are spoiled, that the company always give them free food, free stuff. 
the Marshallists believe that Mexicans are the ones who are oppressing them because they have more ability to mobilize within the, the company and often are become supervisors and often they will uh, oppress the, 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 the Marshallist worker. Uh, the Mexicans will, and so it's often like, often these fights. And when I organize, I try to heal those division by saying, okay, what is the common issue that you all have, right? What is the common problem that we are, because you believe these things, but that's what the company wants you to believe. So you could keep fighting within each other. So within the, uh, through the organizing uh, trainings that I do, I use popular education and through dynamics and games and theater and arts, they come to realize like, oh yes, we, it's a chain of power. It doesn't mean like this Mexican, uh, because it came, became supervisor, it has a, a, it, it's like a, a, a chain of power, right? It, everything, we, one day we did a, a, um, uh, a theater piece and I was telling them, okay, you're gonna, who is gonna be the supervisor, who is gonna be the CEO, who is gonna be the line worker. And through that exercise, they realized that they were all oppressed because the CEO wanted numbers and the rest of the workers had to do whatever they wanted to do to reach of those numbers that sometimes are out of the, of the question, right? So they learn to oppress the other because they need to meet that quota. And by doing that, they come to realize that, yes, we keep fighting among each other, but that is not going to help us to win. As a, as a grassroots organization, I welcome everyone who wants to organize, all the black communities, the Marshallis, there's space for them if they want to translate the name, they're welcome to translate the name or to, you know, but to create those spaces for those communities to come to organize, that's important. But the people that can't come to organize are the Latino workers. And that is just the truth. And, and we cannot do anything about that. And that doesn't mean that we are excluding others. We're welcome others. But if the others don't want to organize, we just have to keep fighting for everyone, you know, because if one win, we know that all the rest of the workers in that plan will win too. And that's Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, a criticism also of the Black Lives Matter movement. Well, what don't white lives matter? And we're saying no right now. If we can work at the the margins, we will bring everyone else gets lifted up. And right now, across cultures, across the globe, people with the darkest skin suffer most. That is just a fact. And the South Asian communities, and Iranian communities, um, and indigenous cultures, that's just it's it's colorism is the word for it in the US. And that yeah. um, that is real. Yeah. And um, I, yeah, it's just so important to know still, you know, like if I claim this is for everybody, but they will come and laundry like, what are you talking about? My girl? You're not black. You don't have any, like you cannot, like it, especially in grassroots organizing, it just whoever comes to organize is whoever is the ones who is doing the work. So this takes me a little bit to a question that I had and also that I see in the chat um, from someone in the audience. There is a live and often contentious conversation happening, especially in the animal rights community about intersectionality with some people feeling it is the only way forward and others feeling it is corrosive and divisive. And also some people saying that it dilutes the efforts of one cause. And Bio, I know you spoke to this a little bit. Um, and I, I think some of you have addressed this, but I was hoping you could more pointedly speak to your, your views on this. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to go for this. Okay, so I, I think there is, there is some kind of confusion or um, there, there is a little bit of a weariness in going into focused communication about who you're looking to support. Um, I, everyone that runs anything knows that the message you put put out there is what you receive back. So, by saying um, that you're an organization that supports Black people, naturally you're going to get lots of Black people coming up to you and saying, "Hey, I would like to support." Um, and if you say, uh, as naturally as uh, Magali said, uh, if you name your 
uh, organization in a language and not everybody understands the people that understand the language will be the ones that turn up and say oh I get it I'd like to engage with you it's not about uh, the important thing about movements is that they are rigid they're ridged objects with many faces and the thing that we're rec we need to recognize as a global movement of people just trying to make the world a better place, no matter what kind of thing that you're doing, is that all of us need to be working together and not trying to exclude either each other from spaces that we need to be welcomed in for all of us to be able to move to a better world. So in this particular conversation about animal rights, it is about ensuring that everybody has a space to say, this is how I care about it, this is what I want to do with it, and I would like your help in moving that needle forward in my community in a way that makes sense for my population and the people that I have direct access to. So I think there is a, uh, there is a responsibility in saying, for instance, I mean, I when we first started Do It Now Now, I did struggle with um, kind of saying black all the time because it was like, because I kept getting the question, why isn't this for everybody? Or why isn't it for people of color? Why isn't it for underserved populations? Why is it for black people and not? Um, and I have kind of held on to this because what we learn about the black, black population there are white working class boys, and it's all over the news in the UK at the moment, white working class, class boys are worse off in their education than black kids. So why is everyone talking about black kids? That's what politi politicians are talking about at the moment. Um, and the thing is, when you work with uh, a certain population that has social determinants that are, are lacking in certain areas, and you, make, and you take a systems change approach that allows the system itself to be better cater for that underserved population, you are making things better for everybody else around you. But unless you allow those populations, not even allow, but encourage and empower those populations to act in the conversation and not have this paternalistic approach that we are going to do it for you, we are campaigning and we're going to fix the problem for everybody. If you take that approach, you're removing people from accessing that information, you're removing them from accessing that power, and you're removing them from accessing that opportunity to be part of the solution. Because if you teach, if you tell someone that we're going to fix it, you're telling them that they don't need to be involved. And that's problematic to me. I think absolutely everybody in the world should be able to find the thing that they are passionate about and then be able to enaction that passion and to support other people to become better in the way that they think they should be better. And it's so important that we empower people to do that. And I think when it comes to the conversation about collaboration, the thing that worries me about people that don't collaborate is that it speaks to a kingpin fashion of kind of wanting to be the one face of this project or the one face of this movement or the one face of this area and that doesn't help everybody that helps one person's ego and one organization's pocketbook and that isn't a movement that is a corporation disguised as a non-profit and that is not okay so it is absolutely integral to it's imperative to every organization to look at how you can help the next generation if there is an organization that is smaller than you that is led by someone that doesn't look like you that is less privileged than you has less access to politicians bankers funders whoever then what are you doing to ensure that they can enter this conversation successfully what are you doing to make sure that they can shape the conversation successfully because otherwise it's just going to be your voice and no one knows it all I just wanted to add something to this that when you were speaking, it made me think so much of what we do, especially in the United States, but I think around the world is we assume that the norm is whiteness and we center whiteness and we think we have to bring in others without understanding that others are existing in their own right all over the world. And so even in this question that, that I had posed, you know, how do we, how do we respond to the claim that we're diluting efforts? How, how do we know that our efforts currently haven't been diluted? Why are we centering the, the whiteness and the way that it's been as the norm? And I'm always trying to um, decenter decenter that in how I talk and how I speak. I don't want it to be man or woman is just default man and woman. And then when I'm talking about a person of color, I'm stating you know, their race or their ethnicity. Um, we need to really think through how do we like what is normal at whose pace are we having these conversations um, 
in order to be effective and grow. And so when we say, um, you know, it's divisive, well, it's also divisive not to have these conversations um, to, to a lot of communities. So I just want to kind of center, or at least name that that centering of whiteness is very common in our language, especially in the United States. Yeah, I'll um, tackle this question too a little bit. Um, you know, I think everything you're saying, Ariana, is right. But the, the, also there is a real debate going on in the animal rights space right now, for better or for worse. I think it's better because we're having the conversation, which is better than not, which is this is going to dilute our efforts. Like we need to focus just on this thing because if you, if you try to ask for a lot of things, you won't, animal rights will be the thing that falls by the wayside and won't get the progress and it will take longer and you know, we need to focus and we're the only people who care about chickens. Nobody cares about chickens and pigs and cows. So we, we got to stay focused. We got to focus our money in this way. We have to focus our efforts and resources in this way. So there's a sense of urgency and delusion and concern. And it's real. These people feel this real concern. It's coming from a place of real caring. And I want to recognize that. I want to recognize people are, this is coming from a place of really good intent. And really, it's not like a, a, a place of hatred. It's coming from a place of wanting to do the best they can in the time that they're here on this planet for animals. But um, I also, I think that it's not a dilution to, delusion to bring, dilute, and now I'm confusing my words, diluting our efforts to collaborate. I think it's lifting our efforts up. It's, um, I think that we're delusional to think that we are going to achieve these ends without being inclusive. And what I said earlier about, you know, factory farming is affecting populations everywhere, but also specifically affecting rural communities and people of color. And if we don't include them in the solutions, we don't, and I, I'm recognizing the include, not include thing that you just said, Arianish, but if we, if, if everyone doesn't come to the table with solutions, if every type of person affected by this problem, it doesn't be included in creating solutions, we're just not going to solve it. It's, you know, I think, um, by you've really talked about like creating space for everyone and everyone being able to come to the table for, to come up with solutions. And I think that's really important. And if we just think about it from one perspective, we're just not going to solve the problem. And, and, and we haven't yet, you know, we haven't stopped factory farming. We haven't stopped this horrible thing that causes so much suffering to animals, to planet, to people. And until we come to terms with this, um, you know, that really what I was kind of saying earlier about how, how much this egregiously affects communities, health and livelihoods, um, and how enthusiastic and great solutions can be, can come from communities directly affected. I think missing, not doing that is really missing a big piece of this piece of the puzzle. And we're not doing that well enough right now. And until we do that, we're not going to get to the end we all want. And we all want to end the suffering that is caused by this huge oppression. Magali, do you have any thoughts? Well, I was just going to add that, um, I mean, for us, it, it's crucial that the people directly affected are fighting towards their solutions, you know? Uh, that is our, our, mission i mean is one of the the strongest uh parts that we have is that the people directly affect and, and and in fact ben seremus was built by poultry workers and myself who've been organizing poultry workers for over five years and so when we bring collaborate and, and we also been kind of betrayed you know by organizations that often say we want to collaborate with you uh and they uh are using the language that we use and then they take advantage of, of us and then they, they do their winnings without counting with us. So we've been through a lot of, we've been through a journey, you know? And so for us, collaboration, it's important, but also we are very cautious because of the, 
the sensitiveness of this work you know it's so uh, about like who is like uh, like bio said like is am i doing that for my own ego because i want to win something or because you are meaningful to do something and to sacrifice yourself into doing this i mean for us building benceremos has been a lot of self-sacrificing you know and so when we talk about collaborations we want to make sure that the people collaborating with us understands that the leaders are the workers and we all have to follow that leadership and you come to our space as an ally and to contribute and to build and to and to share your uh, skills and knowledge but to build the power within the workers and sometimes uh, people don't understand that especially in Arkansas this is a new way of approaching organizing and sometimes they call us we are divisive or we are we don't work well with others well we don't work well with others that don't align <laughs> to uh, to the mission of our organization and the leadership of workers and sometimes that those power that plays around like the white communities that believe that they are the saviors and they want to save us because this idea of workers don't have voice and I am the voice of workers. No, workers have voice. Nobody wants to hear them, that's the problem. And so we don't come with this idea of saving or 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 teaching them you know i of that's why popular education is so crucial to our work because we believe all of us are teachers we believe we all are leaders we all believe that we learn from each other and so whenever other perspectives come with more uh idea of saving or collaboration but i tell you what to do that's what when we don't we don't collaborate well and that is so important to understand when uh, people directly affected immigrants are organizing because they come with with fears but also they have experience uh fighting over issues in our own countries you know many of them have been fighting in our countries um with indigenous movements so they bring that knowledge to this and they are wise people intelligent people and so yeah that sometimes is the the tricky part is to make a white allies or allies to understand that this space they are coming to is to uh to give uh not to take away Um, we have one last question. If we can be very concise, maybe each of you speak for just one minute or so. Um, we got several questions around fish, which I'm really excited about because I think that is something that's an area that we in the animal movement need to do more on. Um, and one question was, are any of you doing work in this space for aquatic animals and humans in these areas, workers in aquaculture and wild caught the wild caught fishing industry also suffer immensely many similar issues, but historically there hasn't been a big focus on this. Um, do you have any thoughts in just maybe one minute each before we close our session? I'm sorry, what was the question? I couldn't hear. Um, how do we uh, address the issues that workers in aquaculture and the fishing industry face? Because a lot of workers in the fishing industry um, face very similar issues. Um, I was just going to say, as someone that doesn't work in the animal rights space in that way, uh, what I can say is that um, we support Black people specifically to gain the skills that they need to be able to build innovations and to lead movements and to build their enterprises and nonprofits. So if you guys can get a Black person interested and passionate about something in that space, we can help them build it. That's what we're here for. Thank you. Leah Armagali. Go for it, Magali. No. Okay, so what we can do to solve the issues? Well, we're address, address. <laughs> address the issues. Um, 
Well, I mean, in my perspective, in our perspective as Venceremos, we have already like something that we want to implement to address the issues that poultry workers are facing. And we are doing that because as I said, we've been in a journey for quite some years, uh, learning, learning from our mistakes, uh, trying this strategy and the other. <laughs> so it's been a journey of, re and, and it's just so important that through that journey, you learn to recognize that this direction was not taken to anywhere um, and to, re to reassess where you're going. And so we went through like a year, so really going through that. And so after traveling to Imokali, Florida uh, and bringing workers, uh, to learn about the fur food program. Uh, it was so beautiful that workers immediately said, Magali, how can we do this in, in poultry? Because it just makes so much sense, you know, how by creating their own code of conduct, they create in their own needs and demands and reinforce them with the supply chain to, uh, and so that the supply chain adopt this code of conduct that will set the standards of how workers need to be treated, reinforced by consumers to put pressure in the supply chain. Because often like people don't recognize where the food comes from, where the chicken comes from. And I think that's so important to connect again the consumers and the responsibility that consumers have to change the conditions for these workers. So uh, we believe that if we can achieve that, if we can target the supply chain, for instance, of, of George's, which is a growing company that supplies to uh, Popeyes, to uh, Panda Express, that people recognize those brands because that, that's where they go to buy their chicken. If they can recognize that and learn that that chicken comes from uh, by inhumane working conditions. And so that way the consumers can put pressure to Panda Express and say, I'm not gonna buy your product until you do the right thing for workers. And then there is this market consequences that consumers have. We have the power to force the companies to, to do what is best for us because it's also a, health, a consumer concern about how the chicken is being processed. And so that's how we uh, aim to, to bring the changes that we need and hopefully uh, that is a reality for workers in the next decade. Leah, do you have any final thoughts on the aquaculture? Oh, well, I'll just say that aquaculture is a nightmare um, for animals and for people. Um, just Google slavery and shrimp. And you may have seen articles on um, enslaved people in Thailand working in shrimp farming. And the connection there is real. It's a terrible you think it's these are things of the past. They're not. They're current. And people are enslaved to produce shrimp. And shrimp suffer enormous amounts, and I could tell you for days about the horrors of shrimp who do feel pain and do suffer as well. There are, for example, female shrimp eyes are removed because they won't mate because the conditions are so terrible, so their eyes are removed as part of the process for causing for, for their to reproduce in these horrible farms. It's a horrible industry, and you should know about it if you, if you are eating shrimp. And that's just shrimp. And then there's all the fish, right? There's not just, like chicken, there's one chicken. There's meat chickens, right? Fish, there's carp and salmon and tilapia and all, I mean, there's hundreds of fish that we're exploiting and the people exploiting, being exploited and the communities that are exploited in the scenarios as well. So in um, a particular community in Peru where the whole, coast of Peru is being fished for um, anchovies and sardines and then that entire community's bird population has plummeted then there's a there's a factory producing the fish and all of that pollution goes into the water and the kids in that community have lesions and illnesses and higher incidences of cancer fishing is a nightmare whether it be wild or aquatic it is so abusive to humans and to um, to the animals themselves, of, of which there are 
hundreds of species. And it's something we just, gosh, I hope that the next 10 years, we really can focus on that. It's really tough when people don't even recognize that fish can feel pain in the first place and that they suffer and can have joy, in fact. So I really am glad somebody asked that question and that we can put it on our radar. Me too. I care so much about this issue, not from a place of they think they're the cutest animals, but just from that justice standpoint of how many animals are killed, how many are killed not in the intention of, in the pursuit of killing them, the bycatch. Um, it's, it's an extremely, extremely abusive and torturous system. Um, <laughs> on, did, did you want to jump? Yeah. Uh, just, yeah, just the kind of put a slightly higher note uh, on that yeah. topic. Um, no, the thing I always wanted about fish in movies with like animals are allowed to be bears and lions. You can, you can like talk and like dance and all of that stuff, but fish still get eaten in movies. The animals <laughs> eat fish in movies. In, in movies where the bears can talk, that fish still get eaten. It's weird, it's <laughs> super weird. I, like, I don't know if someone wants to work on that, like media and fish, but that would be a good topic. Well, I think the animal movement will be and is taking the issue of fish um, more seriously as evidenced by the questions we got around it. And I know that there are a number of new organizations working on this issue, which I'm really excited about. So I do feel very optimistic about um, where we're moving. And I think having greater collaboration and learning from other movements and other sectors is really important. And this conversation is kind of one piece in that puzzle. So I'm really grateful for all of your time. Thank you so much. And I think you had just one announcement about next month's session. So I'll let you jump in here and, and close us out. Thank you all so much. And on the fish note, may I just add, if you haven't read it, you need to read The Outlaw Ocean by Ian Urbina, who has written extensively. He spent loads of time out on boats with fisher people, and he covers the, the slave trade of the fishing industry in amazing detail from a, a journalistic point of view. It's a great book. Um, I mean, I just want to say thank you all so much for such an eye-opening session. I'm actually genuinely going to re-watch this to make sure that I have digested all the things that you've all covered. Um, it, it's been awesome. And I could listen to you. I, like, I could just like keep you here for another few hours and <laughs> if I had my way. Um, but yeah, and also on the fishing note, we are definitely going to have a study in session next year um, on fishing. But coming up next month, uh, we're going to push it to Tuesday, 17th of November at 9 a.m. Pacific time, uh, to the point that our speakers were also talking about today, about silencing workers and the importance of whistleblowers. Our final uh, sentient session is going to close us out with uh, Stories That Matter, which is the role of undercover investigators and whistleblowers in farmed animal protection. So we're going to hear about the law and about the techniques that people uh, use to get to the truth. We've got some great seasoned undercover investigators, Bob Baker, Scott David, and Pete Paxton, and director of Food Integrity Campaign, and Empowerer, and you could call her the protector of whistleblowers, um, Amanda Hitt. And it's going to be moderated by Kaylin Labarge, who's co-founder of Seed, who actually just released their first undercover investigation as part of this new company, exposing the corruption of, um, of the dairy industry in the US. So that's going to be a fun one, which ties quite nicely to this. Um, but yeah, I don't want to keep you, but I do. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you all so, so, so much. And have a great rest of your day or evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.